St. Louis is a very important piece of history. This image that we have of refugees going to country after country begging for admission is a very strong one. When stories about other ships, and there were many other ships and many other stories, uh, were mentioned once or maybe twice, uh, but there wasn't the kind, same kind of serial, serial episodic coverage um, that we see with the St. Louis in, in any other case. There was a suicide attempt. Somebody jumped, tried to commit suicide, jumped ship, and uh, and and was was taken by ambulance to a hospital. There was a burial at sea or on the way over. There were all kinds of things. Everyone had hope that um, they were going to be uh, able to get off the ship in a country that was going to accept them. Part of the narrative thread through these stories is that it looks like they're going to be saved. Oh, it didn't work out. What is uh, the saying that all that's needed for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing? Uh, and uh, you could say that that is exactly the role uh, that Canada played. No one of significant leadership would allow MS St. Louis to land. May 1939, the ocean liner, the MS St. Louis, departed Hamburg, Germany, en route to Havana, Cuba, with 937 passengers fleeing Nazi persecution. People were feeling very positive about being able to get out of Germany. The most profound memory for me was when we were in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and the weather was quite bad. In those days, the ships didn't have stabilizers, so I was profoundly seasick. They had all um, come on board ship with what they thought would be landing visas for Cuba. They had no idea, although the shipping company did, that they might have a problem landing in Cuba. The ship came to the harbor in Havana, and there was hope that uh, we would be allowed to get off the ship and gain entry into Havana as a temporary uh, sort of a crossing point into the United States. But that didn't happen. Cuba refused to recognize their visas and demanded astronomical fees to let them in. The president, smelling profits to be had, declared that the passengers could buy refugee visas. At the same time, the director of immigration, trying to exploit a legal loophole, offered to sell them tourist visas, but he was unwilling to share the profits with the president. The president of Cuba got wind of all of this, so they passed another regulation which plugged the loophole between uh, uh, refugees and tourists. The extortion attempts resulted in mass confusion, and the MS St. Louis was not allowed to dock in Cuba. They were made to stay in the, uh, at, the, at the edge of the harbor, and a couple of days went by, and they didn't get any real information as to why they weren't able to go in, into shore. And then this began a, uh, a negotiation at many levels, trying to uh, negotiate some way to get them into Cuba. My most vivid memory in Cuba was my uncle being in this little boat right next to the ship. And of course, I was constantly seasick on the ship. And when I saw my uncle in this little boat, I was ready to leap off the ship and to, to, to join him in that little boat. And I can still, as I say this, I can see him in that boat with this Cuban man. There was a general appeal that went out, a humanitarian appeal to, to all the Americas. Somebody should come forward and take these people. They're in crisis. You can imagine the fear. The Cuban government was, was demanding that they, they leave Cuban territorial waters. The mood changed radically. Where would they go? Of course, one of the places that there was hope about going was to Canada. Uh, Canada wanted no, uh, no part of that. Anti-Semitism in the 1930s was a global issue. It certainly wasn't isolated uh, to the Nazis or to Europe. And Canada was no exception. Anti-Semitism was on the rise in Quebec, where opposition to the entry of Jews was a powerful political force, backed by the provincial government, the Catholic Church, and much of the media. 
In English Canada, the picture was also dismal. English Canada was was uh, English Canada, and uh, even if you came, if you were Jewish and came from the British Isles, you were still Jewish. You fought your way to school and you fought your way home. I think people economically were scared, and the immigrants were a good target. I remember this, there's two, three guys were sitting on the car, and this very religious Jewish man with a beard was on the streetcar. And he started pulling his beard and making fun, and the people were joining in on the laughter. Meanwhile, in Germany and Austria in November 1938, hostility towards Jews increased in intensity. Anti-Semitism was also felt in Canada. On November the 9th, which is uh, the same day that the Kristallnacht violence is breaking out in Nazi Germany, the Globe and Mail publishes an editorial in which they talk about window smashing, uh, but it's not uh, window smashing in Germany. It's window smashing in Brantford, Ontario. There's, in a way, a certain irony that, you know, the first story we hear about broken glass on the night of broken glass, Kristallnacht, is not uh, uh, about Germany, it's about Brantford. It happens here at home. And Canada's immigration policy made it very clear. Jews were not welcome. Canada took in fewer Jews between 1933 and 1945, proportionate to its population, uh, than any other country in the Western world. And all of those who came from uh, Western and Northern Europe, read Protestant Europe, were put in a uh, category called preferred immigrants. Then they had another class. The undesirable class was largely Eastern Europeans. And then it had a third class called the permit class. Into that class were put all Jews, irrespective of country of origin, except those who came from the United States or Britain. Under Prime Minister Mackenzie King, the gatekeeper to Canada was Frederick Blair, the Director of Immigration, a hardline political figure who did more than stick to the letter of the law. He was the consummate uh, bureaucrat. He believed in very much in immigration restriction. He was seen as tough uh, and direct and blunt. To say that he was a virulent anti-Semite is not, to, is not to, uh, uh, to stretch the case. In 1938, my father applied for visas to get his family into Canada, his brother and sister and families, and he was successful. Everything was all lined up until his sister's husband was rounded up in, in Vienna uh, because he had a non-Austrian passport and killed. He needed a change, a small change to a visa, and Frederick Blair refused and blocked it. Mr. Blair told him, you Jews are too pushy. You will have to uh, convert to Christianity and learn to live with your European neighbors. And uh, he was an extraordinarily hateful person. My father told me over the course of time in my teenage years um, how he uh, made attempts to get money to the family so that they could live at least in the uh, in the uh, transit camps where they were held. They had these camps for people who had imperfect papers. And uh, he was picked up once by the RSMP from the censors that would censor his outgoing letters and warned that if he sends money again, they'll arrest him. He told me that, uh, he told them that he'll have to, they'll, they'll have to arrest him because because he's going to continue to do what he can to save his people. Saul Sigler's sister, brother, and their families were all murdered by the Nazis. King would have found advantage in the sort of position that Blair was taking. He knew that there were a lot of votes to be lost and no votes to be gained by the admission of Jews. So Prime Minister Mackenzie King and Frederick Blair stayed silent on the issue of Jews and immigration. The Globe and Mail condemned their silence. Silence is not possible when people are being treated like animals, being deliberately deprived of homes, of means of subsistence, and the right to pursue a normal life unmolested. In view of the official silence of this country when Canada's democratic ideals calls for a vigorous protest, it is well that the voice of the people rose in mass volume. Many voices were represented in public campaigns to get the government to change its policies and allow Jewish refugees to enter the country. The Jewish leadership tried to lobby the government, thinking that quiet diplomacy rather than more assertive tactics would be effective. There were those, um, indeed, who were trying very, very hard 
uh, collectively um, uh, within the organized Jewish community, such as it was, to uh, get the government to reconsider um, its regulations. Whether anybody was listening is, is, is a different thing. Anxious not to appear confrontational, community leaders initiated backroom discussions with officials at all levels. And these were very quiet and civilized discussions. And as we know, they led nowhere. So in May 1939, when the MS St. Louis passengers made their desperate appeal to the world for help, the Canadian government was poised to do nothing. But the sensational nature of the story landed it where Canadian citizens could not ignore it. All of the coverage of the St. Louis uh, was on the front pages, at least for the first seven days. It was a good story. The captain uh, of the ship um, was a very decent man who insisted that uh, they might be Jews on his ship and his ship might be a, a German ship, but these people would be treated as respected passengers. The captain claimed that there could be a mutiny on the ship. He uh, suggested to reporters that there uh, was a suicide pact, that there could be mass suicides. For him to be so determined to find a place where the ship could land and people could get off and continue with their lives was a very noble thing for him to do. A passenger on the St. Louis, Max Lowe, uh, attempted to commit suicide on May the 30th. He slashed his wrists and jumped into the ocean. The newspaper headlines played like a melodramatic serial. Fears Jews will enter death pact. Refugee liner ignores order to leave Cuba. Dominica offers haven to refugees barred at Havana. Liner carries refugee Jews into Caribbean. Offer respite to wandering Jews on liner. The prime minister was traveling uh, with the royal family on the royal train, including a, uh, a visit to, uh, to the United States. And there was some concern on the part of the Canadian government that, uh, that Canada would be, would be drawn into the middle of this uh, uh, effort to, uh, to negotiate a place for these, uh, these people to go. The story gripped the country. Noted Canadians appealed to the government to intercede. There were editorials admonishing uh, the Canadian government to accept the refugees into Canada and reproducing parts of uh, the, the famous uh, cable that was sent with 41 signatures um, asking Mackenzie King to give the uh, Jewish refugees aboard the St. Louis refuge in Canada. While government officials discussed their true intentions privately, the public awaited a response. The government was silent. The passengers of the MS St. Louis, unwelcome in every country in the world, are forced to return to Europe, which would soon be under total Nazi domination. We know that it was reported in newspapers all over the world, including uh, radio broadcasts in Nazi Germany. Uh, uh, you know, using it as a form of propaganda, look, nobody wants them, right? At the 11th hour, four countries agreed to take the refugees. England, Belgium, France, and the Netherlands. And Captain Schroeder gets permission to dock in Belgium, where the voyage of the St. Louis finally ends. The last article that appears on June the 19th, anti-Semitic outbursts meet refugees' arrival in Antwerp. It ends on a foreboding note. Only the refugees allowed to land in England were saved from the Holocaust. Although initially hopeful they were out of harm's way, those dispersed in continental Europe were trapped by the advancing Nazi dragnet. Little more than half of them survived. Eventually, some survivors like Lisa Avedon made it to the United States and from there, Canada. Her memory of the MS St. Louis never fades. The story of the St. Louis should not be forgotten because we cannot let those kinds of things happen over and over. That where help is needed, where people are not being treated justly, there needs to be ways for society, for governments, to make sure that people are taken care of. I wonder how many ministers or deputy ministers had raised the question, what if we accepted these people? It's a very shameful time in our history. We have to shine a light on what happened. We have to make sure that the next generation know what happened. It is possible to make a difference. But you have to have a voice, you have to speak out, you have to be informed, and you have to get involved.
Thank you.